What's up, everybody? Welcome back. It's Saturday. We're going to do bloody history anyway. So, we're going to continue along this theme of Lauren Hall. Probably for the next couple of weeks. We're only on what? We're up to. We're going to hopefully get through document 46 today. If we get through everything I want to do, that'll put us about, I guess, halfway. But then I got some other stuff. I found a Lawrence Howard file. Um, I'm not going to say where yet, because I found a couple new archives that I've been out there for a long time, but most people have forgotten about. Uh, Multi-hundred thousand page archives. So good stuff. A lot, lot, lot of new um, perspectives to pull from. But yeah, the Lawrence Howard file I got, uh, when, you know, when I flipped through it, it was mostly about Lauren Hall, so I don't know what the fucking deal with that is. Um, they were both guilty. They were both on the sixth floor of the, of the book depository, so. Um, yeah, let's continue. We're on uh, item uh, 29. Uh, this looks like a letter to uh, Tom Bethel from Stanley Primer. Hmm, let's see what this is about. Dear Tom, thanks for your letter of 24 January 1968. Oh, what's the date on this? Um, the date is February 9th, 1968. So, dear Tom, thanks for your letter of 24 January 68. I received it the day after mailing my last letter to you. I'm enclosing a transcript of a telephone interview with Matt O. Wilson. Address and phone number in letter of 28 January 1968, conducted on 30th January 1968. He corroborated what Doyle told me, with two exceptions. One, he thought Oswald's companion should appear in the film. And two, he said the Cubans pushed Oswald around and pushed him down on the ground. Both Doyle and Wilson agreed to look at the film to try to identify Oswald's companion. If they are not successful, Wilson would be willing to try to identify him from photographs. You could send him. However, Wilson remembers Oswald much more clearly than his companion. Weisberg believes a picture showing Oswald's companion appeared in the state's item of 10th August 1963. He also has other information concerning the incident. So I'm assuming the incident is the August 9th scuffle with Carlos Brunier on the street where everyone keeps trying to identify the guy who was out on the street with Oswald. Uh, if you ask me, it's Edwin Wilson. Or was it Edwin Collins? It was Edwin Collins. Sorry. Edwin Collins. So... Um, that's a whole other story. He's connected to Interpen and Jerry Hemming and all these guys, but I think clear as day it's him because of the hairline. Like there are certain unique features that certain people have that really differentiate them from a lot of other people, right? And I'd say the hairline of Edwin Collins is very unique, very, very unique. So yeah, I don't know how he'd be connected to these guys. Cause you don't really see his name pop up in any of the new Orleans stuff, but he was definitely connected to Jerry Hemming and Interpen and Lawrence Howard and those guys. And maybe he was there with them. Who knows? Who knows, when it comes to the actual Oswald and his handling, uh, we don't know very much. A lot of people think they know something, but they don't. There's just not enough information because a lot of the information we have on Oswald is really Carrie Thornley or someone else, right? So, let me continue. Weisberg believes a picture showing Oswald's companion appeared in the state's item of August 10th, 1963. The state's item is a newspaper, not an actual state's item. Uh, he also has other information concerning the incident. I would suggest that if you don't receive the film in a couple of weeks, you could phone Doyle to encourage him to send it. If necessary, Bruce Lewis is willing to go to Portland to get it. If someone will pay his transportation, his address is 1235 uh, the Alameda, Berkeley, California, no telephone. Paul could contact him. I contacted Blazewick again on February 5th to try to determine whether he met Howard before or after he saw the Oswald scuffle on TV. He could not recall, but it seems likely that he met Howard first. Since talking to Blazewick, I read the interview of Hall in the Los Angeles Free Press, 12-19 uh, January 1968, in which he stated that Howard was arrested in November or December of 1962. Uh, I believe he's talking about Lawrence Howard. Blazewick remembered only that he met Howard between the Bay of Pigs and the assassination. Blazewick saw a different scuffle on TV shortly before the assassination that involved members of the 30th of November at the Moscow Circus in Milwaukee. He did not recognize anyone involved, in particular not the scuffler of my previous report. 
He saw the Oswald scuffle on TV before this and is positive he does not confuse the two events. Blazewick believes the Oswald scuffle involved three or four men. Oswald was handing out leaflets when the scuffle suddenly started and included such motion of much motion of people. A telephone pole was visible in some scenes. Blazewick saw Howard at the Miami CIA office. At the same time, he met the scuffler. He also saw him twice at the El Grande and Valencia bars before meeting him. An associate of Howard's in the Patrick's Raiders had a pointed goatee and a mustache which gave him an Asiatic appearance. He came to the San Carlos Hotel twice with Howard to talk to Lewis, the desk clerk. When the Patrick's Raiders were raided at No Name Key, so Patrick's Raiders, he's talking about Jerry Hemming and his guys down at No Name Key. Uh, when the Patrick Raiders were raided at No Name Key, this man, Howard, and Jerry Patrick were arrested. Uh, the three of them, and possibly others, were shown on a TV newsreel after their arrest when they were waiting in line to see a Filipino movie on guerrilla warfare. Howard was just getting into a speedboat when apprehended. Uh, Tomas knew Howard. Tomas did counterintelligence work in cities in Cuba. Contrary to my previous report, uh, Quarito could speak a little English. Another correction is that the, quote, cave bar and the Pan American bar were in the smaller of the two Pan American hotels. Oscar, owner, not bartender, of the, quote, cave, was a friend of Jerry Patrick. Michael A. Jackson, Waukega, Wisconsin, 53826, a friend of Blazewick's, was offered $1,200 to $1,500 by the CIA to captain a boat during the Bay of Pigs invasion. He didn't accept, but a friend of his did. Jackson, who was in Japan, would probably talk if approached indirectly. I think Blazewick has provided ser uh, several leads that should be developed. Steve Burton could try to contact Adolfo Rodriguez Francisco in Los Angeles, and Bill Barry could help in Miami. Blazewick wants to talk to these people himself whenever he can get the opportunity, so it would be best not to use his name. I'm also enclosing an interesting document Jim Schmidt obtained from the National Archives. Sincerely, Stanley R. Primer. Hmm, interesting stuff, little tidbits of information. All right, item 30, studio screening, four pages, transcript and notes on tape recordings of Lauren Hall, made 12-29-67. Excerpts recorded during studio screening. This is all handwritten notes, eight pages of them, from uh, an interview made uh, of Lauren Hall, December 29, 1967. Excerpts recorded during studio screening. One, question, why was the president assassinated? Answer, liberals may have had a part to do with it. Uh, Kennedy was uh, swinging from liberal or left to the center, and this upset the liberals. Also, the mafia had a slight hand in it. Uh, Hall relates mafia and Cuba. Uh, thinks they probably had to do with it. Uh, Hall relates mafia to money to support JFK during his campaign. A question regarding mafia and contract on Garrison's life. Hall disagrees, could see someone like Shaw being threatened, but not Garrison. From his answer, quote, I can name you a man who was an absolute perfectionist pilot. He got killed in a plane wreck. <laughs> Note equals informant says that this is Ward. Uh, quote, Somehow, somewhere, someone is pulling the strings in the lives of those witnesses. Uh, claims he has no knowledge of the JFK assassination. Uh, why does Garrison want him in New Orleans? Answer, quote, I have absolutely no knowledge as to why he would want me down there at all. The only thing I can go on is what I have heard on telephone conversations. Note equals, doesn't he know that he was interviewed by the FBI? Read the audio incident. Five, reference Larry Howard, quote, I was with Larry in Florida when he was training Cubans in Florida. Note that this was after the Bay of Pigs. Uh, Larry was with me on uh, the last raid I was going to make in Cuba. Tell us how he was stopped by the Coast Guard and the CIA. Uh, says this occurred in September of 1963. September 63, odds are that's total bullshit. Um, odds are they were back and forth between uh, New Orleans and 
Dallas at that time. Uh, but I'll look into it. I'll look and see if it's possible he was going to pull something that late. Highly doubtful, though. Hell, even the stuff with Eddie Baia was supposed to go on, like, in June. Like, And I think that's the last stuff that we know of of the raids in Cuba. Uh, where was he on the day of the assassination? Uh, answer, in Monterey Park at home. Okay, so once again, he's saying that he was in Monterey Park, California at home. But, however, we have the previous story that he was at IPCO Hospital Supply. Um, with a guy named Hudson, right? Um, and then that story is later recanted. So we have two different stories from Hall as to where he was, because that fucker was in Dallas. All right. Denies any part of conspiracy to kill JFK. Quote, the only conspiracy I was in on to beat him with ballots, not bullets. Uh, question, will you fight garrisons try to get you to New Orleans? Uh Quote, this is a hard question. I will never stand on the Fifth Amendment. This is my country. I love my country. Therefore, it behooves me to give testimony. If I go back to Louisiana and I'm in the courtroom, I will respect Mr. Garrison. As far as right here and now, I have absolutely no respect for the man. I think it, and it's a shame uh, that a man like Garrison has to do what our government should have done in the beginning. I think that Garrison in a roundabout way uh, is on the right track. Uh, more insults to Garrison in parentheses. Uh, I think that someone should be making an investigation um, then we have question, quote, and you have no idea as to what Mr. Garrison wants to talk with you about. Answer, no, I have absolutely no idea at all. In fact, I heard last week that he was in Los Angeles, and I wonder why he didn't come up and talk to me then. Uh, see note number four, page one. Uh, question, were you at all concerned with the Bay of Pigs? Uh, no, I wasn't, not really. I had a lot of friends that were involved in it. I know that there was training that was going on in Guatemala. In fact, I had some friends that participated in it and were in prison after the Bay of Pigs failed. Hall says, quote, I think that there was probably three and possibly four different plots to assassinate the president. I think that Oswald actually had a part in the assassination of, uh, I think that Oswald actually had a part in the assassination uh, of Oswald of Kennedy. So, question from you, from your own knowledge, and I'm not asking for names or anything at all, but from your own knowledge in knowing about the Cuban affair, do you feel that anybody who worked for or had worked for the FBI or the CIA were at all involved in the assassination? Response equals pauses, comma, laughs, and chuckles. Note, this response has to be seen on color film to be appreciated its significance. This is not just a, uh, no, I can't read that at all. It's a combination of nerves, giddy, giggly, laughter. Uh, quote, you asked me if I knew of anybody. No, I do not. Note, questioner did not ask that. This is Hall's version. Quote, I feel so, so be sure in my own mind that there has been somewhere along the line an attempt made by the FBI. I shouldn't uh, say FBI. I should say, quote, some members of the FBI, quote, to manipulate the evidence and to conceal such evidence. Uh, Dick, I don't think that the FBI itself hit anything or distorted any of the evidence, but I do believe that there were some members of the FBI that either unknowingly or knowingly distorted evidence, either by hiding or not thinking that it was important or something of that effect in uh, so doing completely distorted the whole report, thereby leaving the Warren report with no alternative but to come out with the uh, finale that they did. Hall says, quote, old man Kennedy Joseph, he was a bootlegger back in his heyday, and I don't think from everything that I can pick up, well, for an example, back in the heyday when Joe Kennedy was kingpin, you didn't run uh, an area without being associated with the mafia. I just don't believe that you could, because the mafia is going to be there, and if you're going to make a dollar, the mafia is going to get 25 cents of it. So I'm thinking Joe probably got some money from the mafia to support Kennedy, but the understanding that Kennedy would let the Bay of Pigs go through, wipe out Kennedy, I mean, wipe out Castro, and those bitches over there set the boys back in business and let them in, uh, run along as usual. 
Uh, note equals slip of wiped out Kennedy. <laughs> uh, 14. Hall says, quote, Oswald, as far as I'm concerned, was a communist from the word go. This man went to Russia. He was in Cuba. Uh, he had all of the training necessary for the assassination of Kennedy. I don't think that any communist goes off half cocked. I think that you find that uh, what happened to Oswald there in the police station in Dallas is the same thing that happened uh, to Trotsky in Mexico. That's what it looks like. It looks like Trotsky in Mexico. Uh, instead of someone hitting Oswald with an axe like they did to Trotsky, Ruby shot him. As far as I'm concerned, Ruby and Oswald are tied in so tight that you can't believe it. Now, there's no way I can prove this because I knew neither one of them. I never had a conversation with them in any way, shape, or form. I do believe that 100%, despite his appearance at the Carousel Club, where he's drunk on stage. Uh, Hall uh, says on the government cover-up of the real, uh, looks like 10th in this matter, quote, for a man to get on a television, on a newspaper, and make a statement about the president of the United States or a senator or a congressman, I think that this is real bad taste, especially now, the fact that we're in conflict in Vietnam. Therefore, I won't make a statement on that, but I feel that there is definite reasons that the government a peop or people in government have, have covered up the assassination of Kennedy. Personally, I think he's an egotistical maniac, uh, referring to Garrison. But if I am told by the governor or by whoever takes it uh, to tell me to go to Louisiana, I will go gladly and freely. Because think that it's time that someone somehow uh, help clean up the Kennedy assassination. And of course, I'm not the one to do it because I know nothing about it. Note equals informant says that since this time, Hall has indicated the opposite, that Hall has now decided to employ every means possible to avoid going to Louisiana. On the danger of Clay Shaw or Garrison not living to tell uh, trial time, not living till trial time, quote, I think they're as safe as babies in the wood. Uh, quote, I think the mafia and people of uh, America are laughing at Garrison. I think they're mistakenly laughing at Garrison because I think that the man is it. Uh, basically, he's right, but I think that he's uh, witch hunting and this is wrong. This is not good. Um, on the air, transcripts and notes on tape recordings of Lauren Hall made December 29th, 1967. This looks like separate notations. Excerpts recorded as they were broadcast live on the air. Note equals some of these appear in section on studio screenings and others do not. Uh, have a quote from studio screening portion on the mafia, liberals, etc. That's number one. Number two. On contract on Garrison's life again, same as studio screening, but quote, I can name you a man comes through here referring to pilot who died in plane crash. He knew uh, this phrase is garbled on the other portion of the tape where it appears with studio screening Number three newscast. Reference Larry, uh, Larry Howard Jr. Uh, phone call with his wife. Note, um, informant states that Howard has definitely decided to stay as long as possible in Mexico because of this case. Uh, newscast on Beckham, January 1st, 1968, 11 o'clock. Uh, Hal interview. Uh, that's Hal, probably a Hal Verb interview. Valuable admission here in the public record. Um, Hall equals, uh, quote, I was in Cuba and when the revolution ended, I got into Havana. I was out at the question mark with Camillo uh, Cienfuegos. I had about 60 men that were being trained as marksmen. Uh, we were going under the camouflage of being in for the invasion of Nicaragua, whereas what it was actually about was the assassination. 
in reality, of top communists in Cuba, uh, because we found out that Castro and the whole 26th of July movement was giving uh, communists, was going communist, so that a democratic government would take over the rule, of, so that a democratic government would not take over the rule of Cuba. How does that uh, include Castro referring to assassinations? Hall says, uh, yes, it did. Uh-huh. Question, it seem, I seem to remember that you were imprisoned in Cuba at one time. Yes, I was in prison for about six months. Did you escape? No, I didn't escape. I was uh, out at La Cabana, and I was out at La Cubana, and I was out at, looks like C-I-U-D-A-Quidad, Libertad, and I was out at the D-E-E, -E, Air Phonetic the phonetic station, and then they transferred me from the Estamba Lior prison that I was in to Trescornia. And while I was at Trescornia, I finally got a message through to Camillo Cienfuegos, and Camillo came out and put me in the car, uh, the command car, and took me up to the airport and put me on the plane, and I flew by commercial airlines back to the United States. That's interesting because the the incidents at Triscornia. All right, so here's my thing with Triscornia. <clears throat> McWillie says that he went down to Triscornia to visit Giuseppe, Giuseppe de George. Right, Giuseppe de George to me is obviously Jack Valente. And so um, at Triscornia was Traficante, uh, Lauren Hall, and then we have allegedly a dealer with the Cap a dealer with the Capri. Giuseppe de George was also allegedly a dealer with the Capri. Uh, a dealer at the Capri who lost all of his money. Uh, that was Giuseppe de George, right? But allegedly in jail now, you have a person going by the name of Henry Savadra, who was a dealer at the Capri, uh, worked directly for Traficante. Simultaneously, this incident at Trescornia, you have McWillie going down to visit Giuseppe de George. So, okay, we can put Giuseppe de George, who was a dealer at the Capri and gambled all his money away. Um, and remember, Jack Valenti was in deep with uh, Joe Lucia, who was a known bookmaker, right? Gambling, fucking his money away, right? So I make this connection between the Cuban dealer at the Capri who gambled all his money away and Jack Valenti and his relationship with, with Joe Lucia, who was the known bookmaker in Houston, right? Uh, so to me, this is kind of like, is it a stretch? I don't really think it's a stretch. I think this is just this basic things that you'd look at as a researcher, right? So these are, things, I think, pretty direct connections to Jack Valenti. But now we can say that we've got like Henry Savadra and Giuseppe de George both at Triscornia at the exact same time that McWillie was going down there and that uh, Traficante was down there and that Lauren Hall was in prison with these guys because him and Henry Savadra and um, Traficante all got out the same time, right? They all three got out at the exact same time. So, come on, come on. I, I'm, if, if my guys out there want to look up Henry Savadra, you're not going to find a whole lot, but go ahead and do it. Um, I'm telling you it's an alias because remember the alias game are real people with shared names. That's it. So I'm pretty confident that's Jack Valente. Can I prove it? No. Maybe one day. All right, moving on. Note equals audio incident information on her father, etc. Uh, denies attempt to re-enter Cuba to assassinate Castro. We're talking about Lauren Hall now. But talks about his raids inside of Cuba to um, build up a will to resist the, the butcher Castro. Remarks about Cuba being lost to the communist world. And uh, number eight, January 2nd, 68, excerpt equals uh, views about assassination strategy, doubts that he, Hall, could do what Lee Harvey Oswald is supposed to have done, despite the fact that he has $200, a 30 6 rifle with $70 scope. <laughs> That's funny. It's referring to the rifle with Richard Hathcock uh, that he picked up from Los Angeles, right? So... These fucking guys, they had to have known that that Hall was in on this thing. But we're going to get some newspaper articles that claim the opposite here coming up. Maybe we'll get to those today. So uh, moving on, item number 33. Let's see, what does this say? How would FBI have known uh, to ask questions in lost, looks like par in last paragraph, uh, if they waited for the, looks like refont, reserve, I can't read that. They... 
communicated faster century reassures than they did to the commission. I don't care. I don't understand what the fuck they're saying there. This looks like an official document, possibly an FBI document. Um, the following investigation was conducted by Special Agent Richard J. Burnett. An inquiry was made at the Records Bureau of the Dallas Police Department, Dallas, Texas, on September 15, 1964, to obtain photographs of Lauren Eugene Hall and William Houston Seymour, who were reportedly arrested by the Dallas Police Department on charges of investigation for violation of the dangerous drug law. Uh, Miss Judy Hahn, clerk, Records Bureau, Dallas Police Department, advised that on that date that her records do not indicate that either Hall or Seymour were photographed by this department at the time of their arrest on October 17, 1963. Ms. Hahn checked with the Identification Division of the Dallas Police Department and was advised that they have no record of either Hall or Seymour having been photographed by this department in the past. On September 21, 1963, Lloyd Sanders, Identification Division, Dallas County Sheriff's Office, Dallas, Texas, advised that his files contain no reference to either Hall or Seymour. On September 18, 1964, Mrs. Marjorie Rigby, Assistant Manager, Crestwood Apartments, 1080 Magellan Circle, Dallas, advised that her records do not indicate that anyone with the surname of Ferrer or Ferrer or similarly spelled surname was residing at this apartment developed during September 1963. Mrs. Rigby stated that the rental records of this development are not kept by apartment numbers or street address, but simply by the name of the renter. She stated that a person by the surname of Ferrer or a similar name could well have been living with some other tenant and such information would not have been known to her office. So they're investigating here. This is an FBI document just covering the fact that they're talking to the Dallas Police Department, trying to figure out uh, what the deal is with... Um, Lauren Hall and William Seymour, who got arrested on October 17th, 1963 for dangerous drugs and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? I think they had weapons too, but the weapon part got overlooked. Let me see. I can't really read. This is a handwritten note. Uh, num item number 34 says, uh, Fred Press uh, something 3164 from... Something Feds Question by FBI in 1964 has worked for, uh, can't read that. I can't, I can't read this. I'm just going to skip this document entirely. All right, now we've got some newspaper articles. I uh, can't, doesn't say what this one is, but it says, uh, it's on page 14, May 24th, 68. Hall deposes to Garrison in New Orleans and is, is exonerated. Oh, I'm so glad Hall got exonerated. Ooh, what a relief. Uh, this is by Paul Eberly, Los Angeles Free Press. Lauren Hall just returned from New Orleans at 11.30 a.m. Saturday morning after spending a week there with Jim Garrison. Garrison has subsequently released a news release on the appearance of, Lawrence, of Lauren Hall in New Orleans as follows. In connection with our inquiry into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, this office has questioned Mr. Lauren Hall at considerable length. Uh, Mr. Hall, who came to New Orleans voluntarily, was completely cooperative as a witness. It is apparent that Hall was in no way personally connected with the events culminating in the assassination of President Kennedy and Dallas. On the other hand, it is equally apparent that other individuals and agencies caused Mr. Hall's name to be injected into exhibits of the Warren Commission and to other statements so that any effort to investigate the assassination would cause his name to appear. Uh, were elements of a professional intelligence agency execute an assassination, as was the case with the murder of President Kennedy, the operation includes not only the setting up of decoy like Lee Harvey Oswald, but the creation of artificial leads pointing to persons who are actually not involved. Our office is satisfied uh, that the appearance of Hall's name in commission exhibits and other statements by supposed sources of information is such a case as is unsupported by any facts. On the other hand, Mr. Hall proved to be a helpful witness for our inquiry because of his extensive experience in anti-Cuban raids from Florida in the early 1960s. We want to make public our appreciation of Lauren Hall's cooperation, Hall's genuine concern about the assassination of President Kennedy or about the subsequent concealment of the truth was apparent, and our office is indebted to him for his help in the investigation. Question, what was your reaction to meeting with Garrison and your conversation with him? Answer, I think my meeting with Garrison was quite interesting. I was sitting at a desk in front of one of his investigators and was going through a photo album book, uh, identifying certain photographs, and while I was looking through these photographs, all of a sudden, every muscle and tendon in my body tensed up, and I knew that Garrison was standing behind me. I looked up, and then from behind me, uh, a man speaking with no southern accent, a voice that you knew was that of a 
man of intelligence and compassion, said, is this Mr. Hall? His investigator said, yes, this is Lauren. As I turned, I did not think I was ever going to quit looking up because he is such a huge man. I stood and shook his hand, and, his recommend, and he recommended that we go to his office where there was more room. There were approximately six or seven people in Garrison's office, and Garrison stated, I want to bring this to your attention, that we do have microphones in the walls. They are not on now, and we don't use this type of questioning without permission uh, from the witness or a person we are interrogating. These microphones were placed here by my predecessor. He then stated that, with my permission, he would bring in a tape recorder and tape our conversation so it would not be necessary to take so many notes. So we brought in the tape recorder, and then the district attorney of New Orleans went to work. I want to say now that his questioning and his method impressed me, as that of a man who was completely and totally thorough, highly competent, and of a man of intense drive to get at the truth and to get all information from me that I had concerning my activities for the year of 1963. After four days of intensive questioning and identifying uh, the names and pictures of uh, and of giving all the information that I had, uh, the interrogation almost was finished. I had the privilege of having dinner with Jim Garrison and two of his special investigators, and something happened that really struck me. We were sitting there having a salad when an old couple from Ohio who were in the hotel on vacation were sitting behind us having dinner. They were about 65 years old, and the elderly lady uh, got up from the table and walked over to district attorney and said, Yes, you have to be Jim Garrison. I could not mistake you. You are Jim Garrison, aren't you? And the district attorney said, yes, I am, ma'am. She said, I want to have the pleasure of shaking your hand because we know that you are right and we pray for you every day. And with God's help uh, and our blessing, we know that you will give the truth to the world. And there was a plot to assassinate the president. And please be careful because America needs you. And then she went back over and sat down at her table. And that really did something to me. It made me feel like here was a man of great qualities. And I was really proud to be sitting there with the district attorney of New Orleans. In looking through the photographs, were you able to identify anyone from California? <clears throat> yes, I was able to identify five or six photographs of people here in California. Did Garrison feel that these people were important? I don't know, because I was uh, the witness stand, and he was not divulging information to me. He was getting information from me. Have you, since your trip or before, been threatened by anyone or warned to keep silent about anything? There's a lady in Whittier who received a telephone call from a Mr. Bradley or someone who was supposed to be... Bradley. First of all, he asked, would she give him my telephone number so that he could contact me? And she told him she did not have my uh, telephone number and didn't know how to contact me. And he said he wanted to get a hold of me and told her to tell me to get off his back. Approximately three to three and a half months ago, Bradley went uh, to another lady in Whittier and took this envelope uh, with newspaper clippings in it and gave them to this lady in Whittier to give to another lady in Whittier that knows me and said to be sure and give this to Lauren Hall. Let me pause right here for a split second, okay, ladies and gentlemen, because who else um, is from Whittier, California? And who made a special trip from Whittier, California in May of 63, stayed in Whittier, California, allegedly, quote-unquote, uh, for several months before heading back through Mexico City to New Orleans on September 4th? None other than Carrie Thornley, right? So now we have a connection between Lauren Hall and Edgar Eugene Bradley and Whittier, California. Something tells me that there was somebody in Whittier, California, who recruited uh, Carrie Thornley. And that those people are probably obviously connected to Lauren Hall and all these people later on. But uh, yeah, Whittier, California. Second time this is popping up from seemingly unrelated pe people who are definitely connected through New Orleans. Strange, huh? <clears throat> it's my understanding that this is his, Bradley's writing. It gives the date, uh, the name of the, of the mail, and the name of the newspaper it is in the Valley Mail. There was no other message except telling this woman uh, to tell you to get off his back. What he was mostly interested in was contacting me, and when she would not give him my address or how to get in touch with me, then he said to tell me to get off his back. Then you think what he wanted was to speak with you directly. Right. I would also like to say on another previous occasion that uh, he had his attorney call my attorney and ask him if I remembered Bradley yet. Then on another occasion, he told a newscaster here in the L.A. area that, yes, I do remember Lauren Hall, but I remember him by the name of Lorenzo Pasillo. 
There are absolutely no doubts in my mind that Bradley remembered me right from the beginning. When I did not remember him, and I testified to the fact I didn't recall ever having met him, then I recalled having met him, and where and under what circumstances. Uh, this really bothers him because I placed him with and at the house that was noted for their anti-Semitic and paramilitary feelings and thinkings. As for him calling me Edgar Bergen's dummy, I don't blame him a bit because I would probably react that same way. But now I do expect a note or something of an apology from Bradley uh, because I am positive in my mind from the calls and stuff that I have received from him that he has remembered me right from the beginning. Not me, but Bradley is the liar. He is the Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen is pulling his chain. And it would be really interesting to see who was at the other end of the chain. Uh, could it be the one pulling his chain as some member of the CIA or National States Rights Party? You're saying that Bradley is a CIA man? In my mind. What else do you know about Bradley? Just a refresher, that's Edgar Eugene Bradley who he's talking about. Uh, what else do you know about Bradley? That is all I know about Bradley. What do you think uh, precipitated the assassination of President Kennedy? I can say this. I have changed my mind considerably concerning the assassination of President Kennedy. I previously thought... It was originally precipitated by the liberal establishment, but since so many other facts have been brought to my attention, I have changed my thinking slightly. I no longer think that the liberal establishment precipitated the death of President Kennedy. I think I can give some basic uh, to the change in my thinking uh, by saying that neither did the conservative establishment have anything to do with the assassination of President Kennedy, but that it was precipitated by the fascists and rightist anarchists and that actually they are the one and the same. By that I mean that President Kennedy in 1963 was trying to coexist with Russia and with Cuba and with other communist satellites. And he also stated that he was going to do away with the CIA because it was an unnecessary evil in the way they operated. That we needed an organization for intelligence purposes, but that the CIA was actually a secret government. That they were responsible to no one except themselves. When President Kennedy started coexisting with these other countries and made statements he was going to do away with the CIA, he was signaling his own death warrant. Now I will try to put everything in proper perspective. In the NSRP, you will find that they have a tremendous amount of ex-military officers, that in most instances, a big uh, percentage of these officers, either with the NSRP or not a member of are employed as special engineers or some other title with the specialized industry war machine. Prior to 1941, army officers were third and fourth class citizens, and in 1941 they became first class citizens. They relished this and wallowed in their glory. In most instances, this was proper because they had saved our country from, non from the Nazis, but they became accustomed to being the real power and the glamour boys of the country. Then in 61 and 62, Kennedy said that we will coexist. This meant that the war machinery manufacturers would start losing all the deals they were getting from our defense efforts from the Cold War. It really perturbed some of these men because they could see themselves going back to uh, obscurity as second or third class citizens in a peacetime economy. And so few of them, plus a few members of our secret government, the CIA, decided that it was better for our country. Uh, Kennedy should be put out of the way. So then they went to work building up a plot that would shake the world and their scheme was just about successful because Johnson took over office and we then became no longer coexisting with the communists. If it wasn't for a man like Jim Garrison, who has the fortitude and love of this country and the democracy for which we stand because he took it upon himself to right the wrong that was done to John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. I firmly believe that the rightist anarchists and the CIA can take over a country right now and it would be a fascist state except for two things. They would first have to demolish and destroy the conservative movement by the radical right. They would have to destroy organizations such as the John Birch Society and bring discredit upon it. And in this way, they could destroy all of the small charters. This is where the conservatives are in the small charters. If they can destroy persons like the Bill Richardson, uh, Jean Rousselot, and Dr. Fort and bring discredit upon them or bring doubts upon them or in any way vilify them, then these anarchists and the CIA will bring about a fascist society. By these anarchists, who do you mean? The fanatical right, I am positive in my own mind that once the fanatical radical right or these anarchists have successfully destroyed the conservatives, we will then become a total out-and-out -out Nazi fascist state. 
The other thing that is in their way is a man, a big man, a giant man by the name of Jim Garrison, the district attorney of New Orleans Parish and the 68% of the American people who think that the Warren Commission uh, report is a bunch of horseshit. Because as Jim Garrison has said, if a government can lie, a government can kill. If a government can kill, then we have an anarchy. Then we have an anarchy. And I am unequivocally right now saying that we were there were some members of the government who were responsible for the murdering of John F. Kennedy. There were a lot more members of our government who, at twelve thirty-six on the afternoon of November twenty-second, nineteen thirty-six, were looking at their watches. There were a lot more at twelve thirty-six who sighed with relief. Were any attempts made on your life before you went to New Orleans? There were three things that happened to me which could possibly be considered as attempts on my life. I don't know. I can't prove they were, but I came down with serum hepatitis. And then on the night of December 31st at New Year's Eve party, someone hit my right arm with a needle. I also know that a 1954 Mercury tried to run me off Mountain Road while I was en route from my home to Bakersfield. On the third time that someone had taken out a socket wrench and removed three bolts of my steering column and I almost had a head-on collision uh, with a retainer wall as a result of that. What do you think of New Orleans? I think it is a beautiful old city with a lot of new modern buildings, but the most significant thing about New Orleans was the fact that New Orleans is Jim Garrison's town. Not because he manpowered or forced his way, but because the people of New Orleans gave uh, New Orleans to Jim Garrison as a reward for the magnificent job that he's done in New Orleans as district attorney. And for now, you can walk down the streets of New Orleans without getting rolled, mugged, or hustled. There are no more gambling casinos. There is no more open prostitution. Jim Garrison has cleaned the town up and made it a tourist town where you can go and see in safety without any threats of violence. fascinating just to get that peek into the mind of Lauren Hall. Whether he's telling the truth or lies here doesn't even matter. It's just an insight into his mind. All right, what do we have here? Oh, I got to tilt my head. Garrison. Okay, here we go. Lauren Hall. That's Lauren Hall right there. Uh, sniper team planned to kill the president, says Hall. <laughs> all right, this is all sideways, so I'm not going to read it. Actually, let me see if I can just flip this thing around right quick. Uh, I'm not going to bother. Let me just move on. All right. Uh, looks like uh, witness... I can't see what that says. It's all grayed out. Witness called in JFK plot probe. Uh, trio allegedly knew of suspect actions. Uh, grand jury subpoenas were issued Friday for three out of... Uh, State witnesses in connection with the district attorney Jim Garrison's investigation of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, uh, those subpoenaed to appear February 1st and 2nd before Orleans Parish Grand Jury were identified as follows. Lauren Eugene Hall of Kernville, California, Lawrence John Howard Jr. of Los Angeles, and Thomas Edward Beckham, a former New Orleans president li uh, presently living in Omaha, Nebraska. Garrison said each of these three witnesses was in a unique position to observe activities relevant to to the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas on November 22, 1963. The district attorney said none of the three men were questioned by the Warren Commission, which conducted the official investigation of the president's death. Garrison contended that Hall arrived in Dallas prior to the assassination carrying a 30 caliber rifle. Garrison added that this was hardly an inconsequential matter inasmuch as he earlier stated that Kennedy should be killed after the assassination Hall returned to California. It is alleged. Uh, Hall, a bartender in uh, Wofford Heights, California, about 125 miles northeast of Los Angeles, said Friday he intends to fight the subpoena right down the line. Hall admitted being in Texas during the time uh, the subpoena noted and that he was active for one year in the Free Cuba movement in 1963 denies charges. However, he denied ever meeting Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby, or David W. Ferry, or anyone else involved with the assassination, or anyone ever uh, mentioned by Garrison or anybody else. Oswald was labeled by the Warren Commission as the lone assassin of President Kennedy. Ruby, a Dallas nightclub operator, shot Oswald to death two days after the assassination. Ferry, a New Orleans pilot who died earlier this year, was implicated by Garrison as co-conspirator with Oswald. Ruby and others in a presidential death plot. Uh, the subpoena for Hall and Garrison said Garrison has information that he checked into the Dallas YMCA in October of 1963, remained in Dallas until the time of the Kennedy slayings. Good catch, Garrison. 
Uh, it was further contended that Hall was in Dallas with Jack Ruby and other individuals believed to be involved in the assassination, that he brought a weapon to Dallas shortly before the assassination, that he was active in the Free Cuba movement in Florida, Louisiana, and Texas, that he was previously engaged in CIA-sponsored guerrilla training in Florida for raids on Cuba that he was associated uh, with Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas. The document also charged uh, Hall contacted Ferry in New Orleans before the former arrived in Dallas. Retorting to Garrison's charges, Hall said he was in Dallas for two days, about two or three months before the assassination. I was driving through on my way to Miami and stayed at the YMCA for one or two nights. I don't remember which. He said he was in Louisiana once back in 1963, and that was for about three and a half hours while driving. Uh, he was driving through to Miami. Hall said he spoke uh, to only one man while in Louisiana, a Cuban who ran a laundry. The guy used to be head of the Cuban railroads under Batista. He said he was unable to remember the man's name. Batista refers to uh, Cuban leader Valencia Batista, who was um, toppled from power in 1959 by Fidel Castro. Hall admitted being active in the Free Cuba movement, collecting equipment from California, Texas, and Florida, and was executing raids on Cuba. The raids he added involved blowing up bridges, starting fires in sugarcane fields, knocking out radio antennas, anything we could do like that. Uh, he said the raids went on for about a year until uh, a boat he was on was stopped by the CIA. Was stopped by CIA agents. They confiscated everything we had, but let me go. <clears throat> I was never charged with anything. Hall asserted. About his Dallas trip, Hall stated he was arrested before he got to the YMCA. He said he was jailed for one day for investigation, but for what I never found out. These charges were dropped. I was released and I went straight to the YMCA. Hall denied ever bringing weapons to Dallas. Um, the Beckham subpoena charged that he was in association with Ferry and various other individuals at 531 Lafayette Street. The Lafayette Street address was identified as the same office building described as 544 Camp Street. The address used on leaflets handed out by Oswald in New Orleans during the summer of 1963. Hang on a second. I need to double check something right quick here. Um, the date of this, what was the date of this article? Well, it's obviously in 67 or 68. And so by 67 or 68, what do we have here? Um, so the, I'm going to reread this and I'm going to explain why I'm rereading this. Uh, the Beckham subpoena charged that he was in association with Ferry and various other individuals at 531 Lafayette Street. The Lafayette Street address was identified as the same office building described as 544 Camp Street. The address used on leaflets handed out by Oswald in New Orleans uh, during the summer of 1963. Okay, so this is where I'm kind of stopping here because there's a little bit of obfuscation over this Oswald having used the 544 Camp Street address because I think that turned out to actually be false. OK, however, um, we know it's false because of Fred Litwin, who is a fucking scumbag Zionist shitbag, um, who hey, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Right. So that motherfucker was able to find the documents showing that the 544 Camp Street was not actually on documents that was handed out by Oswald. But that dumb fat fuck, he he, he basically said that that was um, manufactured by Oliver Stone when they made the fucking movie. Right. I'm going to have to do some more digging into this and go through um, Litwin's documents on this. But um, here, in, in, by 1968, we have a newspaper indicating that the address on the leaflets handed out by Oswald was 544 Camp Street. Okay, so obviously Litwin got it wrong when he blamed Oliver Stone. Because here we have the proof from 1968 that it was already alleged that Oswald had used that address. But... Um, Note to self, to Ergo and to Tony, um, go ahead and go to Litwin's site and pull the documents for this, and we'll go over this in the chat later. Uh, Beckham subpoena contended uh, he was further connected with Ferry in that both were ordained priests in the old Orthodox Catholic Church of North America. The subpoena said Beckham operated a Cuban mission on Rampart Street and was in active association with certain Cuban exiles in New Orleans in whose company Lee Oswald was seen. The document said Beckham has knowledge of CIA-sponsored guerrilla training conducted near New Orleans, adding he has knowledge of intelligence activities occurring in the office of W. Guy Bannister. Bannister was former head of the Chicago Office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
Link alleged. It is said Beckham was reported to be in Dallas in November 1963 with one Cuban exile, and that a number of those persons with whom he was in contact in New Orleans and Dallas are believed uh, to have played a part in the assassination. Garrison, in his press release, said Beckham was originally from New Orleans and was an associate of Ferry and Sergio Arcacha, former Cuban exile leader in New Orleans, now living in Dallas. Beckham, who lists himself as a bishop of the Universal Life Church and entertains with Western music under the name of Mark Evans, said in Omaha Friday night that he met Ferry for about 10 minutes, long enough to say hello and goodbye several years ago. Mentions Martin. He claimed he was introduced to Ferry, who had some uh, supernatural stuff for hair by New Orleans private investigator Jack Martin. Beckham said the only time he has been in Dallas uh, was late last year and was then accompanied by Dr. F. Lee Chrisman of Tacoma, uh, Washington, with whom he works as a psychologist and whom manages his entertainment career. Uh, after claiming that he had never met Oswald, Beckham said, all I know is that President Kennedy was assassinated and Oswald was blamed for it. Uh, Beckham said he does not know Garrison and several of his staff members, adding that he worked as an investigator. Oh, said he does know Garrison and several of his staff members, adding that he worked as an investigator for Garrison about <clears throat> three months in late 1962. He said there's no record of his employment because he was paid in cash. He also knows William Gervich, Garrison's former chief investigator who resigned and criticized uh, the DA's investigation. Gervich told the Times Picayune Friday night that he doesn't ever recall meeting a Mr. Beckham. <clears throat> Quote, he would never have had an occasion to meet me, said Gervich. I was not a member of Garrison's staff at the time. Beckham claims to have worked for him. We travel in different circles. Refused to return. Beckham said he will not return to New Orleans because, quote, if I did... I would destroy myself. Uh, if Garrison is sincere, he can come up here and question me. I'm not running from anything, and I'm willing to take a lie detector test. Beckham said that he was uh, in trouble once in New Orleans when he was arrested for running a lottery in a church on Rampart Street. An offer of immunity by Garrison was greeted by scoffs from Beckham. How can a man who's supposedly supposed to prosecute the law provide protection from it, he said. Uh, the Howard subpoena indicated that he also knew Ferry in 1963 during the course of several visits to New Orleans. The document said Howard was engaged in CIA-sponsored guerrilla training in Florida for raids on Cuba, that he was active in the Free Cuba movements in Florida, Louisiana, and Texas, and that he associated with Ferry and others at 531 Lafayette Street. If further stated that Howard checked into the Dallas YMCA in October of 1963 and remained in the city until the Kennedy slaying, it is uh, said he was in contact with Ruby and other individuals believed to have been in the assassination. Okay, so uh, one more thing I want to throw out there is that I know for fact, or there's some speculation, I should say, there's factual speculation, that some of the Cubans, which maybe have been misinterpreted, uh, maybe Lawrence Howard, because he's dark-skinned, uh, were staying... Um, at a place own, owned by Tammy True, who was uh, a stripper for Jack Ruby. Um, Ergo and Tony and uh, RN, if you want to pull stuff on Tammy True, maybe we can start to link Tammy True to Lawrence Howard's stay. Um, and maybe if we can even put Tammy True's um, house or boarding house or whatever the fuck she ran, if we can put that in North Oak Cliff, we might be able to link that to... Um, dropping them off uh, the day of the assassination after uh, Seymour flees to the tidy lady laundry, right? So if we can make that connection, that'd be fantastic. All right. Uh, Garrison, in his press release, said Howard was also known by his war name of Alonzo Escurido. Uh, in the early 1960s, he was a close companion of Lauren Hall's in guerrilla activity in Florida. He later met Hall in Dallas in the fall of 1963, Garrison stated. The subpoenas were issued by criminal district judge Matthew S. Braniff. Each subpoena grants the witness immunity from prosecution if he obeys the summons. In his statement, Garrison accused the Warren Commission of uh, trying, quote, to hide the fact that for the first time in American history, a coup d'etat had occurred, resulting in the carefully planned execution of a president. He said that President Kennedy plainly was shot from a number of different directions. He also contended that the American people have never been told the names of 10 men who were arrested in Dealey Plaza in the minutes after the assassination. Uh, they later were quietly released after the murder of police officer J.D. Tippett in another part of Dallas, uh, provided the necessary diversion uh, to cover their release, Garrison said. He, his investigation has uh, identified some of these 10 men 
uh, assassination participants uh, in the assassination he added. Oh, let me just comment real quick. Is like uh, I think in my second year of uh, research, I pulled a whole bunch of information on like Jack Todd and Angelo Caston and like a bunch of these Dallas fucking guys who were. I'm pretty confident by my own recollection were some of these 10 men arrested in Dealey Plaza, but I never really followed that up too much. Um, actually I did. I pulled a whole bunch of documents, but they never connected to anybody else. Right. So they never connected to any of my mob guys. They were obviously there through their connections with Jack Ruby. Um, but yeah, Angelo Thomas Caston, Jack Todd, who the fuck else? Um, what was his name? The guy who ran the AVGA. Um, Dolan. I forget his first name. There was a Dolan guy who was involved in that, living in Oak Cliff. Um, yeah, there was a whole bunch of guys who I'm pretty confident I uh, were identified and arrested in Daly Plaza. And then we have the one man who was identified in Daly Plaza that no Kennedy researcher has ever fucking talked about to this goddamn day except for me, and that's the one and only unidentified Louis Shug, L O U I S S C H U G. Louis Shug. You find a goddamn anything to do with Louis Shug, I'll fucking give you a free copy of my book. So, um, good luck with that one. But yeah, so uh, as far as the ten men arrested, I did do a whole bunch of work, and a bunch of these guys I think were Dallas guys, local Dallas guys, like Angelo Thomas Caston and uh, Jack Todd, and a bunch of these other fucks um, who I'm gonna have to man. I'm gonna have to go digging through my notes. I've got like hundreds and hundreds of pages of notes and stuff that I took in the early days that I haven't revisited in years. Um, maybe I will do some shows on that stuff coming up. But all right, let me get back to it here. Uh, quote, um, they later were quietly released after the murder of police officer J.D. Tippett in another part of Dallas uh, provided this uh, necessary diversion to cover their release. Garrison said his investigation has identified some of these 10 men as participants in the assassination, he added. So uh, moving on, I can't tell. I think this is a separate uh, separate article. Uh, Pentagon reports Garrison Service, Washington, from the Associated Press. The Defense Department said Friday... Uh, James C. Garrison, New Orleans District Attorney, was released from active duty by reason of physical disability in the rank of captain. The Pentagon said that he was released October 31st, 1951, and that he served as a member of the National Guard on four separate occasions, beginning with his enlistment June 1939, ending with his uh, resignation last February 28. Information contained in personal, medical, and similar files will not be released to the public without written permission of the person concerned. The Defense Department said it added the Army is conducting investigation uh, to determine if any information about James Garrison's service has been released from official Army sources. Garrison has become a national storm center through his investigation in the assass- into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Garrison insists killing in Dallas was the result of a conspiracy hatched in part in New Orleans and was not the deed of Lee Harvey Oswald acting without Confederates. The Warren Commission, which investigated the assassination, named Oswald as the killer and said it found no evidence of a conspiracy. In New Orleans, uh, Chief Assistant DA Charles R. Ward said Friday night that he feels there is a snide in France in the Defense Department's report on Garrison's military record. Jim Garrison is still a member of the U.S. Army Reserves and holds a commission as a lieutenant colonel, added Ward. It is very unlikely that anyone with a psychological problem would be allowed to hold the rank of lieutenant colonel. The Pentagon said it has been queried by numerous newsmen concerning the military uh, background of Jim Garrison. In response, it issued this statement. James C. Garrison, currently a lieutenant colonel, United States Army Reserve, not on active duty, served as a member of the Louisiana Army National Guard and the National Guard of the United States on four separate occasions, beginning with his initial enlistment in June of 1939 and terminating with his resignation on February 28, 1967. He was a lieutenant colonel, National Guard of the United States at the time of the resignation automatically, and by law, he became a member of the United States Army Reserve at the time of the resignation from the National Guard of the United States. He was on duty as enlisted man from January 13, 41 to June 22, 1940. He was commissioned on June 23rd, 42, and served till March 1st of 46. He was stationed at Fort Still, Oklahoma, Camp Roberts, California, Picos, Texas, Camp Rucker, Alabama, and the European Theater of Operations. He was separated at Fort Dix, New Jersey. He was recalled to active duty on July 24th, 1951, served until October 31st, 1951. He was initially assigned to Fort Sill, Oklahoma during the period August 1951 to October 1951. He was assigned to the U.S. Army Hospital, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and to Brook Army Hospital, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Published orders st- state that he was released from active duty by reason of physical disability. 
in the grade of captain on October 31st, 1951. Information contained in personal and medical similar files will not be released to the public without the written, uh, written permission of the pub person concerned. Army is conducting investigation to determine if Jim Garrison uh, service has been released from official Army sources. All right, so some just some background information on Jim Garrison as we head towards the end of this article. All right, witness changes stance. Looks like dated 5-1-68, May 1st, 68. DA's Kennedy probe gets a surprise assist. Surprise assist. A witness sought by District Attorney Jim Garrison in his Kennedy assassination probe was quoted in California today as saying he may have information which could support the theory of a conspiracy to murder the late president. The Los Angeles Times reported today that Lauren E. Hall made what constituted a surprising reversal of position in an appearance before Edwin Meese. California Governor Ronald Reagan's Legal Affairs and Extradition Secretary. Hall earlier was subpoenaed to appear before the Orleans Parish Grand Jury in the probe, fought the subpoena, and won his battle in the, pre in the California courts. He previously insisted he had no knowledge of a conspiracy to kill the president. According to Los Angeles Times story written by former New Orleans Jerry Cohen, Hall says now his memory recently was jogged by certain individuals, reminding me of persons I was in contact with in 1963 before the assassination. He says he had supplied me uh, at a meeting yesterday in Sacramento, California, with the names of these certain individuals, reminding me of persons I met while making speeches in the Los Angeles area when I was raising funds for anti-Castro activities. On almost every occasion after I finished talking at one of these meetings, Hall said, I'd overhear some people there discussing the possibility of assassinating Kennedy and how it might be done. Not just Kennedy, but also Chief Justice Earl Warren and other government officials, how they could be gotten rid of. Hall, an adventurer who once was a Castro prisoner, claims to have spoken at more than 50 meetings in Southern California in the early 1960s, seeking support for anti-Castro guerrillas. Hall himself was a guerrilla. He said that during the speeches, he never uh, personally advocated harming the president, although he did express disappointment over uh, handling of the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. Hall declined to specify sites of these meetings, uh, but said he supplied Meese with those uh, he could remember. He said he has been giving serious thought to Garrison's demand that he appear here. Garrison's office has been in contact with me, and there's a chance I might reconsider. Uh, he said he made his uh, decision to go to Meese after being assured by a California judge that his previous testimony would not make him subject to prosecution for perjury. He said he asked for uh, the audience with Meese to protect myself in the event I do decide to go to New Orleans. Meese had no comment on Hall's story. Earlier, Garrison said he would set the date for the trial of Clay L. Shaw, charged with participating in a conspiracy to assassinate the president. Early next week, if Shaw's attorney do not file for rehearing before the Louisiana Supreme Court by Tuesday, Shaw's attorneys have attempted to get his trial moved at least 100 miles from New Orleans. Their change of venue move was denied by criminal judge Edward D uh, A. Haggerty Jr., and they asked the state high court to review the decision. Last week, the high court said it would not interfere. The attorneys have until Tuesday to ask for a rehearing. All right. So I think that's going to wrap up for today. We get, we made it up to item number 38 uh, in Weisberg's collection of files on Lauren Hall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to uh, pick up a signed copy of the book, hit me up. I've got one soft cover for 50 and I got seven hard covers left for 75. They're shipped uh, domestically only unless you want to spend like 30 to 50 bucks on shipping. Because Canada and the rest of the world fucking suck. Uh, last time I shipped a book to Canada, it cost me 31 fucking dollars to go one country over. Okay, if you want a book shipped to Europe, you're going to spend probably 50 bucks on shipping at least. So hit me up, um, and I have those in stock now. Uh, and we'll be back tomorrow with part five of uh, the Lauren Hall files in the Weisberg collection. Thank you. <laughs>